Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Long U.S. China Institute's first webinar of the new academic year. I am Emily Baum, the director of the Long Institute, and today I am very excited to be joined by Dr. Joseph Ho, who is going to be giving a talk on his forthcoming book on photography and missionaries in early 20th century China. Dr. Ho's talk today is titled Photographic Encounters, Visual Technologies and Missionary Modernity in Republican China. And in it, he is going to be taking us on a visual tour of the ways that missionary images and films helped shape American perceptions of China at a really transformational time in Chinese history. So just a quick note about our speaker. Dr. Ho is an assistant professor of history at Albion College in Michigan, where he's also an associate of the University of Michigan's Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. He is the author of the book, Developing Mission, Photography, Filmmaking, and American Missionaries in Republican China, which is going to be published by Cornell University Press in January, very exciting. And he is also the co-editor of the volume, War and Occupation in China, the Letters of an American Missionary from Hangzhou, which was published by Lehigh University Press in 2017. So Dr. Ho's talk will last for about 25 to 30 minutes and afterwards we'll have time for an audience Q&A. Uh, everyone should know the deal by now. If you wanna ask a question, please do so using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will collect the questions and ask them on your behalf at the end of the talk. And you don't necessarily have to wait for the Q&A to ask your questions. You can type them in at any point during the talk. So in total, this webinar should last for about an hour, but if you can't stay until the end, we will send the link to the YouTube video to all registered participants in the next day or so. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joseph Ho. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that kind of introduction and the invitation to speak at the Long U.S. China Institute. I'd like to thank the Institute for hosting this event and to all of you who are listening and, and watching today, um, just it's great to, to be here with you. So let me go ahead and start by sharing my screen uh, so we can actually uh, get started with all this and we will go from there. All right, so my topic for today um, centers on photographic encounters. What does it mean for visual technologies and what I call missionary modernity to essentially represent and, be, and embody encounters and experiences between Americans and Chinese communities in Republican China. And as we start, I wanted to have us think about some key categories and um, topics that I'll be covering today. First of all, the idea that vernacular or amateur photography and filmmaking by American missionaries and Chinese individuals are mediations of transnational modernities in the 20th century. And I define missionary modernity as this kind of in-betweenness in, in the way that missionaries are moving between the United States and China. Um, Chinese Christians are involved in this transnational project of uh, community building and also nation building. And in the midst of all of this, modern visual technology, cameras, movie cameras, uh, photographs and film, embody these evolving historical meanings. They, they themselves, like their makers, their subjects and their audiences, move through space and time. And these technologies and materials have diverse afterlives of their own. And as we, as we think about the images that come out of these technologies and these materials we're looking at today, these images represent ground level experiences of American and Chinese communities across this long period of um, major historical change. Um, I won't be able to talk about all of these developments in today's talk, but certainly my book, Developing Mission, will go into further detail about the, the ways in which these images and makers and technologies appear in moments of peace and war and regime change across modern China. To get us started for today's talk, um, the major figures that I'm looking at uh, for today, uh, these are people that are talked about throughout my book, but primarily in chapters one and three of Developing Mission, Dr. Harold Henke and Jesse May Henke, who are American Presbyterian medical missionaries in China between 1927 and 1949. 
Also referenced today, uh, Dr. Ralph Lewis and his wife, Roberta Lewis, were also Presbyterian medical missionaries in China between about 1933 and 1952-1953. Um, also, a couple of other uh, Chinese represent people who are representing um, these other experiences uh, in today's talk, Dr. Li Qinghai, um, a professor who is uh, working at Tsinghua University, Wuhan University, and his spouse, Liu Zhu, uh, who is a nurse at the uh, Beijing Dao Hospital, Dao Ji Yiren, uh, who is also has worked in Tianjin and Wuhan hospitals. So we got, probably should start in the present day you know, to think about the current family members, the current whereabouts of some of this material and uh, members of the Lewis family and the Henke families are with us today uh, or will be listening in on this uh, presentation. So I wanted to just kind of um, put up the, the pictures of the, the families who have also assisted in, in my research. Um, on the left side, there's my wife, Jing, with Harry Lewis, his wife, Norma Lewis and Charles Lewis, the sons of Ralph Lewis. And there are also two children who are not shown here Cecil Lewis um, um, and Wendy Lewis, who are also the, the daughters of Ralph Lewis and Roberta Lewis. On the right-hand side, we have Dr. Richard Henke, who is in this photograph preparing to uh, screen a film for me in 2013 at his home in Rolling Hills. And I'll come back to these family members in a moment, but for now, I want to thank them and acknowledge them for their contributions to the work that uh, I've done and, and the images and experiences you'll be hearing about today. Now, let's go back in time. Where do we start? And we can start with these images, these two photographs. First of Dr. Lewis on the left-hand side using his Roloflex twin lens reflex camera, which I will discuss in just a moment, at Beidaihe in Hebei province in 1936. And on the, the right-hand side, um, you previously saw uh, Richard Henke. There's Richard again <clears throat> with his mother and father and brother uh, on the steps of their mission residence in the city of Shunde uh, in Hebei province in a photograph also taken by Dr. Lewis. And these images are a good representation of the convergences and the technologies and the experiences that we'll be covering <clears throat> in just a moment. What about those technologies? When missionaries in the 1920s and 1930s arrived in China, they were equipped with, a new, with new kinds of visual and image making technology. These were smaller cameras with uh, faster lenses or wider aperture lenses, more sensitive film emulsions that were, you know, of course, now at this point in time in the 1920s through the 1930s and 40s circulating around the world. And we have in missionary magazines in China, in this case, the Chinese recorder that's printed in Shanghai, um, advertisements for these new kinds of imaging technologies, smaller cameras, mobile cameras, more sensitive film, um, cameras that will go any, anywhere. This is, of course, the uh, era in which documentary photography as a new art form and a reportage form is taking off around the world, and missionaries are privy to this. They are thinking about the ways in which cameras and photography and filmmaking will accompany them in their work and in, the, in their experiences in Republican China. And as we kind of scale in, we have the, the kinds of cameras and the kinds of equipment that uh, we're thinking about. Let's turn to now the first photograph that the Henkies, Harold Henke and Jesse May Henke took as they arrived in China on October 2nd, uh, almost 94 years ago to today, um, 1927. And this photograph was made possible by the fact that the Henkies had carried to them, to China with them, a small folding camera that allowed them to essentially, as the ship was approaching the dock in Tianjin um, after their long journey from the United States to unfold this camera and with a sensitive enough film emulsion and high enough shutter speed, freeze the motion of the ship approaching the dock. And we have in this sense, this moment of looking and imagining the moment at which missionaries are now witnessing China for the first time and trying to make sense of what that means. And in that moment, their camera, cameras are with them. And it's this moment at which they are starting to think about what it means to be entering what they will later call the land of their adoption and seeing Chinese people and Chinese communities and infrastructure for the first time and how they might someday very soon be in the midst of these environments. 
As the Hankies enter their uh, early years of uh, language school training in Beijing, um, they carry that folding camera with them. They walk the streets in a kind of flaneur type uh, viewing and thinking about what their belonging and where their place is in the environment. And you get these images of almost tourist-like or um, quasi-ethnographic uh, visuals uh, with this small camera accompanying the hankies as they move through the city. And keep in mind, they're learning Chinese at the same time. They're also uh, thinking about what their mission is going to be like. They haven't got to their mission yet. So these photographs allow them a way to not only capture, but think about how they belong to the environment and how they might even communicate with people in front of and behind the lens as they move through these new spaces. Within about a year and a half, um, again, of intensive language training, the Hankies, Harold and Jesse May, uh, go on to their formal mission in Shunda in Hebei province, where they also carry their camera to make images of medical activities. And uh, my book discusses uh, essentially what these activities are and how these images play into representations of these uh, activities. But in a sense, we also get to see that the people in the images become closer and closer because that's what's happening with the hankies. They're becoming closer and closer to the Chinese communities, the people that they're either treating or working with or worshiping with as Christian missionaries and medical missionaries in this part of China. And they're producing photographs both for their own consumption as well as for the consumption of audiences back in the United States and other churches and bodies in China. We know this because they choose certain images to be colorized. These are originally colorized images, hand painted, um, that the Henkies printed and then sent out for colorization in Beijing. And then of course, either kept or displayed or mailed back home to the to, to United States congregations. But we're seeing images and the camera linking missionaries to the environments they're working in as well as the congregations and environments they have left behind in the United States. Within a few years of work <clears throat> at Shunda, um, the Hankies are joined by Ralph Lewis and Roberta Lewis, uh, both of whom, whom become very close friends of the Hankies. And Ralph Lewis um, brings to China a Roloflex twin lens reflex camera which is very similar to this model, which I'm gonna show you right now. Hopefully that my green screen isn't killing it, but he carries his camera with him um, in his travels in China and produces hundreds and hundreds of these square, um, basic square format, very detailed images of all sorts of Chinese life, of missionary life. And this mobile camera also uh, is a way of the, you know, the Lewis's, Dr. Lewis, engaging with the environments around him, which I will explain in just a moment. Just keep in mind that image of uh, Dr. Lewis bending over that camera for one second. Among the images that Dr. Lewis produced were these images. Um, one on the left side of a self-supporting Chinese church, a church that was funded by an engineering school that was itself started by Chinese elites and educated students in Beijing. Um, and Lewis travels there in 1934 to photograph a baptism ceremony and the entrance of some, some new members to the church. Um, and this is notable because in this, I'm not showing it here, but there's another image in which he's in the church. He's at the far end of the church. And if you think about the position of how he might use that camera, this camera requires that you don't look straight through it. You have to look down into the viewfinder to actually make the image. So he looks like he's curled up in a ball, looking down into the viewfinder, presenting an almost submissive or bowing posture to the people in front of the camera. And the camera itself has structured the performance in which the missionary is not the key figure. It is the people in front of the lens. It is the Chinese community, the self-supporting church that is the key figure in the key community um, in relation to this camera. And even the camera, the way someone uses that can influence their position in a space, whether they're, you know, have this giant device pointing at someone or this tiny little device that they have to curl over to basically get this image. On the right-hand side, um, Lewis worked in Hunan before he went to Hebei and joined the Hankies. And this particular photograph was taken after a memorial service for a Dr. C.F. Brown who had died not in China, 
but in Oklahoma during a car accident or after a car accident. And news of Dr. Brown's death was telegraphed to the Hengzhou Presbyterian Church in Hunan province. And it was the Chinese Christians who set up a memorial for him using a photograph in the place of his body. So in a sense, these images and the technologies involved, um, both photography as well as communications technologies are connecting communities in China to those in the United States and structuring even religious imagination about a man who has died, you know, serving China but has died in America and connecting his death to now the people who are grieving for him in the Chinese community in Hangzhou. Of course, still photography is not the only technology we have to focus on today. And to, to offer a bit of uh, insight into uh, this other kind of technology that's, that is being used during the time, I would like to put up this image of a American Presbyterian um, mission meeting in North China around 1932, 1933. And at first glance, it's just a group of you know, missionaries with their children and their colleagues gathered together on the steps of this building. But if you zoom in just a little closer, you'll notice that it's Harold Henke and Jesse May um, in that uh, zoomed in image on the left-hand side. And Harold is carrying a box. And what is that box? Well, that box started not in China, but in another place in Rye, New York. Um, which I did research, a church that I did research at, the Rye Presbyterian Church in 2017. And in the basement of this church, I found a reference. Resolved that the offering taken at the service to be held Christmas Day be used for the purpose of a moving picture camera for Dr. Henke, missionary in China. And that box, which is also hiding in the background of the image that you saw earlier with Richard Henke, Robert Henke, Harold, and Jesse May, is that movie camera. A collection in a church in Rye, New York, purchased for the sum of $150 in 1931, which is the equivalent of about $2,000 in today's money, a Cinecodac 16 millimeter spring wound movie camera to be shipped from New York to China to be used in the mission that the Hankies operated at. By the time the Hankies left China in 1949, they had shot 6,400 feet of movie film, both in color and in black and white. I'm unable to show the films today because of technical limitations due to Zoom, but the sense of these, image, these movies, and I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A, is that they are representing the dual sides of a mission that is contending with pressures from both conservative and liberal elements in the United States. There's uh, this thing called the modernist fundamentalist controversy in which um, conservatives in the United States, church leaders are accusing missions of being too liberal, focusing only on saving people's bodies and not their souls. In the, on the other side, liberal missions or liberal uh, church leaders are looking at conservatives and saying, well, you guys, you only care for the souls and not for the body. And even the films that the Hankies make are divided into hospital films, care for the body, and church films, Care for the Soul. And I can certainly discuss more of the contents in just a moment, but just to give a sense of what that camera actually looks like, this is the Cinecodac movie camera, which is right here in this place right now. Uh, the Hankies uh, provided this camera for my research. Um, and uh, if I just kind of crank it up, it actually still works. So just for now, let me see if I can get this working. And we can actually listen to the sound of this camera running. All right, so this is a device and also a device that's going through an odyssey and a movement of its own that is transcending temporal boundaries. It is narrating moving images, is combining the communities of, of Chinese Christianity that are focused on humanitarian work and physical healing as well as spiritual healing and spiritual community. The films that pass through the Cinecodac, um, again, this is Richard Henke showing me those films in 2013, um, and these films make up a good portion of the, um, the, the, the third chapter of my book, and bridging time, bridging space, as well as bridging communities. And to, again, think about the kinds of modernity that missionaries are encountering, I wanted to kind of start to, to conc conclude by talking about this particular story of yet another photograph album that is not in the, in the United States, but is rather still right now in Wuhan, um, a photograph that I encountered 
in the year 2011. And this is a photograph album that was collected by the doctor I mentioned earlier, Li Qinghai, um, who is a professor, again, of surveying um, at Tsinghua and Wuhan, Wuhan University. This particular album, which uh, will have some connections to what I just spoke about, represents these other kinds of modernities, these non-religious or national modernities that Chinese intellectuals and elites are also constructing at the same time. Li Qinghai is the man in the glasses on the left-hand side of this image. And he was a, a intellectual and a professor who had been educated at Cornell University, again, the publisher of my book, which is kind of a neat contact there. Um, there's Cornell, Cornell campus on the upper left-hand side. These are all photographs from Li Qinghai's um, photograph albums. And he had traveled throughout the United States in the 1930s. He ends up working um, during the war at Lianda, the Southwest Union University in Kunming, this wartime amalgamation of Chinese universities. And after the war, he returns to Beijing and he's been thinking about you know, modernization, ways of constructing Chinese infrastructure and surveying. And he meets a young woman, um, Yuju, whose images then start to populate this album that Dr. Li is putting together. And within a few years, um, of meeting his that future wife, we get this image, also from that photograph album in Wuhan, and it's the Henkies. Mrs. Henke, Jesse May, Harold Henke, standing in front of the steps of a mission residence in Beijing, their post-war posting, and there they are with Liu Zhu. The occasion was the wedding of Liu Ju and Li Qinghai, in which the Henkies had actually endorsed the marriage of Liu Ju, who was a Christian, to Li Qinghai, who was not a Christian. And they had essentially sponsored or, or provided for their wedding reception. And Li Qinghai took photographs of the Henkies on that day and put them in his family album, while the Henkies collected a photograph of Liu Ju and Li Qinghai and pasted that into their scrapbook album. And as we think about these multiple convergences and then divergences, as we know within a year, the missionaries will have, be starting to leave China, they will be uh, ev evicted or uh, expelled by the new governments, the PRC. Um, these images start to diverge and the convergences um, I can talk about later on in, in the Q&A as well. But to think about how these connections, these ideas and experiences that transcend national boundaries and also cross these major developments in Chinese history in private images, in missionary images, in individual family photographs, to think about how they might come full circle. I had the privilege of meeting with Liu Zhu in Wuhan in 2011. And I asked her, do you remember the Henkies and their photographs and their films and she said, yes, I, I watched those films when they were first, they were fresh out of the camera. They were screened for the mission in Shunda, where Liu Zhu first met the Henkies as a young nursing student. And she described these images as eye-opening. And she told me about all these experiences. And underneath her bed was the photograph album that her husband had put together with the Henkies in those tiny little images on their wedding day in 1948. And I was so struck by these experiences and how these transnational connections are embodied in these materials, in these memories, in these technologies. And when I went back to the United States, I found in the Henke's scrapbook, a photograph of nursing students. And at the far left corner of this row of um, nursing students, in an image taken not by the Henkies, but by Ralph Lewis in Shunda in late 1937, I found Liu Zhu. She was a refugee. She had escaped the Japanese invasion of North China, found refuge in the Shunda Presbyterian Mission Station where the Henkies and Lewises were working and entered the nursing school and thereby started her career, her long career as a medical professional from that moment on. And I digitized the image, I mailed it, emailed it to uh, Liu Zhu's son, and 16 days later, he wrote back, and he, he mentioned that his mother had passed away. But before she had passed away, 
she had seen the image and she remembered, even though she was suffering from dementia, she remembered the names of every single one of the people, the women who were sitting next to her in that photograph, as well as memories of the Lewises and of the Hankies. And as I think about this and all these multiple frames and multiple connections, we have to think about the fact that in a way, these are frames within frames, images, technologies, human experiences and memories that have collectively coalesced around these moments in time, structured by lenses, by films, by photographs that are in themselves transnational to the core. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a exciting and visually stimulating talk. Um, I'd like to remind people that if you have questions, please um, enter them in the Q&A box. Um, and Joe, if you could stop sharing your screen for a second, we'll get right into the Q&A. Um, so I think just maybe to start things off, I had a question as I was listening to you talk just about the sources and the images that you were able to obtain for this this book project. I mean, it seemed that most of these images came from personal collections, either in the United States or in China. But how did you know that these collections existed? And how did you even make contact with the owners of these collections in the first place? That's a great question. Um, a lot of it was coincidental or, or providential. Uh, in a way, my, my first contact with the Henke family is, was at UC San Diego. Um, when I was an undergraduate there and I was doing a, a summer while well, I was working at the Chinese uh, Historical Museum in downtown San Diego and a man walked in with all these artifacts that he was donating to the museum. It turned out he was Richard Henke, uh, the toddler in that photograph. And now, uh, again, he was uh, an elderly person and um, I think he might be listening to this talk right now. So hello, Rick. Um, but uh, he, uh, I just talked with him about, you know, how he got these artifacts and he said, I was born in China in 1934 and my parents were Presbyterian missionaries. I just finished a um, thesis on wartime photography um, in China. And I asked him, do you have any photographs? And he said, yes, we've got a lot. We also have movie film. And then he invited me over to his house. And then he was like, oh, you know, you know these other, this other family, the Lewises, um, who I'd grown up with in China, they also have photographs. And it was one after the other, the Hankies put me in touch with uh, Liu Zhu's family in Wuhan. The Lewises put me in touch with other families and then it kind of coalesced from there. Great. So this is a question from a um, fellow professor of Chinese history, Peter Zhou, um, who is curious about how your um, interest in this topic emerged. And I also actually sort of had a similar question because I know that you uh, have a personal hobby in photography. So I was wondering if there's some intersection between your personal interest in photography and your academic interest. Absolutely. So a part of the interest was thinking about how images and, and devices, you know, imaging devices, you know, reflect history, frame history. Um, one of the professors at UCSD, Jeremy Brown, um, who you, you guys might know, um, was very influential in leading me to think about windows onto history. And I've always been interested in cameras as devices and how they might play a role in uh, preserving history, also my own family history, China and Taiwan. And I thought, you know, there's, there's a, something there about how these devices um, preserve history, but also don't really appear in history. You know, they're, you always see the products, you don't really see the devices. So in a way, the experience of making images and the, the afterlives of the images themselves can structure new ways to look at these windows onto history. So it really started with a personal interest in cameras and family history, which has now become an interest in East Asian and Chinese history in Sino-US history as seen through lenses and photographic uh, experiences. Excellent. Um, so this is a question from Adam Chin, who asks, how do you think the relationship between missionary activity and media technologies have changed into the 21st century? And in particular, he's thinking of things like taking selfies, which can then be immediately shared with wide audiences via social media um, versus kind of older ways of um, sharing photographs, which kind of decentered the missionary photographer. So how mm -hmm. have, have the changes in media technology evolved into the 21st century? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, and I, I'm gonna chew on that for a little bit. I think a really quick response is, 
perhaps what we're looking at right now, Zoom, uh, in a way that in uh, these kinds of new technologies centered on the internet have also decentered relationships between um, mission organizations and perhaps Chinese uh, bodies, Chinese churches, um, in that you can directly connect right with people through the medium of the internet through Zoom. Um, so in a way, we have images doing similar things as they did in the 20s and 30s, connecting communities. But we also have images and technologies removing the missionary from the picture or even allowing for contacts. Uh, I have this image uh, that I of going to China and seeing a group of Chinese Christians talking with a pastor in Texas, I think, through Zoom. Uh, and, and they're holding a Bible study. So in a way that has decentered and, and deconnected organizations, but in a way it's also brought them closer together through the medium of the internet and the visual imagery. Um, so the questions are just kind of pouring in and I'd like to remind people to use the Q&A button, not the chat function. So that way other people can also um, see the questions as well. So this is kind of a technical question asked by Victor Hansen, um, who's curious about where the images were processed and developed. Great. Um, I love that question because I, I kind of thinking about doing that myself. Um, they were processed, a lot of them were processed in the basements of the houses that you might have seen in some of these uh, images. Um, Dr. Lewis, for example, had a, a dark room in the basement of his home. And uh, his son, Harry Lewis, um, actually remembers his father saying, don't come in when the red light's on, because that means I'm processing film. Uh, Roberta Lewis also writes about processing images that his, her husband had made um, and developing, so she was integral part of developing these negatives and these photographs. So sometimes they were done at home and sometimes they were sent out if missionaries didn't have the apparatuses or the time, they were sent to photo processing places in you know, Shanghai, Tianjin, Beijing, sometimes Hong Kong, um, where these images were processed commercially and then sent back to their makers. So that's a great question. Um, all right, another question. Uh, uh, this one is, is quite interesting. It's being asked by Anthony Clark. Um, and he is curious about the afterlives of these photos. He writes, it appears that the afterlives of these photos are linked to missionary denominations. So Protestant missionaries largely preserved these images in their homes, whereas Catholics tended to preserve these images in archives. So can you say something about how the culture of photography was different depending on the denomination of the people who are taking the images? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, and I think to respond to that, the element of family imagery is strong in thinking about this. For example, all the images I showed today are from family collections, um, passed down to from you know parents to children to grandchildren. Um, so the tra trajectories, the afterlives of Protestant images may start off as family images and then end up in archives or continue to be in families um, for the long run. Um, so the visibility is different, right? Uh, you have to know the family to also uh, be able to see the images or access the images. Catholic orders um, are sending images back to their institutions, um, not necessarily their, their families. Um, although I also have uh, references to Catholic uh, priests and missionaries who are sending individual photographs to their family members and then the large majority back to their home orders or institutions. So that of course changes the dynamic, um, how images are processed, how they're seen and how they're published or not published um, can vary depending on your order or on your family connection. Um, but for the most part, um, we also have large collections of uh, Protestant missionary images at Yale, the Presbyterian Historical Society, um, various Methodist archives. So they overlap, but they also diverge in terms of their trajectories. One of the things that's just so fascinating about your research is how many different aspects of modern Chinese history and visual technologies it touches on. I mean, I think we're getting questions about, um, you know, the, the processing of, of these visual technologies, but we're also getting questions about Christianity and missionaries in modern China. And so this next question is more about the Christian aspect, not so much about the visual imagery aspect of your research. Um, so this question is asked by Suzanne um, Model. She um, is curious about the influence of Presbyterians in China. So she writes, I'm aware that Presbyterians made many conversions in Taiwan and that many Taiwanese Americans are Presbyterians. So could you comment on the significance of Presbyterianism among Chinese in China and Chinese Americans? 
That is a huge topic. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, for that question. I'm not sure I can answer it adequately in a few sentences, but it's interesting to think about those legacies, right? Because a lot of the Presbyterian communities in Taiwan are in, in a way specific to Taiwan uh, in their trajectories, but also a good number are essentially uh, churches and bodies that have come over from the mainland after 1949. And Presbyterianism and Presbyterian churches were a huge, they had a huge network in China um, up to 1949, 1950, um, of which there has been much written about. So I, I won't you know, uh, you know, go on and on about the details, but certainly there's a lot there about the legacies that uh, Presbyterian churches have had in China and the mainland um, up to 1949. And I'm happy to suggest more references um, later on. Um, yes, maybe we can put some references in the chat um, as we as we continue to, to go through the, the Q&A. Um, so this is a question about uh, the, the types of themes that missionaries captured in their photographic images. Um, and the, the question is, is coming from Jackie Armijo, who asks, were individual missionaries assigned to photograph different themes or issues, uh, or were they basically just deciding what to photograph as they, as they went along? Great question. It varies. Um, so I've, uh, again, re references to Catholic missionaries. I have a whole chapter of my book de dedicated to passionist missionaries who are Catholic order from New Jersey, uh, who ended up in West Hunan, China. And there's one missionary there who's, who basically writes, I'm the photographer. They gave me two cameras, or I, I you know, like photography, I've carried two cameras to China. I'm the one who's going to start making these images. And eventually other missionaries get cameras too, in his order. Um, but for other missionaries, it was kind of ad hoc. Like if you liked photography, you brought a camera with you. Um, in the case of the Henkies and their movie camera, a church uh, responded to a request from Dr. Henke to purchase a movie camera for him. And finally, we have the case of the Methodists who basically set up a audio visual department in China to process images coming in from all of their stations across China and then printing them into lantern slides and sending them out to other missions to be used as visual, uh, visual aids. So some of it's institutional and some of it's, some of it's personal. Um, but again, there are a lot of overlaps and it depends on the context and of course the missionary order or denomination. Um, so there are a couple of questions just about your book itself and your methodology and various plans for publishing and translating your materials. Um, so maybe I'll just try to combine a couple of these questions into, into one. Um, so one person is, is just curious, just if you could talk a little bit more in depth about the argument of your book. So what are you actually um, arguing? What is the general scope of, of the monograph? Um, and kind of a, on a similar topic about the question of the book and, and your publishing and translation of it, this is a question from fellow a professor of modern Chinese history, Kristen Stapleton, who is curious about whether or not you have plans for publishing your book in China and what that might look like. So I will answer uh, Dr. Stapleton's question first. Yes, uh, I would love to have it published in China um, and we're working on possible translations moving forward. Uh, to the other question about uh, the, the argument of the book, I think it comes down to mediation, to think about how missionary modernity is specifically constructed in between Chinese modernity and Western imperialism or American empire in the Pacific and these are people who are essentially non-state actors operating under or between these two kinds of modernity. And in the meantime, the mediation aspect is intrinsically and centrally tied into the making of images and how these technologies and, uh, and photographs um, and, and images in general structure on the ground encounters between Chinese individuals and American individuals that comes down to thinking about images and mediation in transnational ways. That a missionary making a photograph in China is not just making a photograph you know, in a vacuum. This person, um, man or woman, is making images to enter a transnational network and to bridge communities and to think about what modernity is in ways that aren't just captured by government bodies or imperial bodies um, and images lend themselves well to that kind of mediation and imagination about fluidity and transnational experience. So that, that's in a nutshell my argument, but again, um, I recommend the book to you if you want to 
uh, chat chat afterward. I'm happy to talk more about the details. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is just a plug for Joe's book. It's coming out in a couple of months, but you can pre-order it on the website for Cornell University Press. We already dropped the link for it in the chat, but maybe Brian, if you can put the link back in the chat so people can go over to the website and go pre-order a copy of the book. It's clearly galvanizing a lot of uh, attention. And I think that we can see that in the sheer number of questions that are still continuing to pile in. And I'm gonna try to get to as many of them as possible in the remaining time that we have. So there are a couple questions on methodology, um, and I'll just group a couple of those together. So um, one question is about the challenges of being a researcher working with these types of old photos transnationally, both in China and overseas. So what types of challenges did you have to overcome when you're working with these types of sources, particularly in China? And then uh, another question is about just how you go about starting a project using visual technologies to document modern history in the first place. I mean, what was your particular approach to using visual imagery to talk about this particular subject? It's a, both excellent questions. And uh, I hope we can record who's asking them so I can contact them later with, with <laughs> probably better formed answers than I'm, I can provide here. Um, but the, the answer to the question of challenges, uh, of course, is access. Part of it is accessing family archives and, and church institutions and archives uh, in, in China, as well as to trace the trajectories of how images got there, as well as the absence of images. I wasn't able to talk about it here, but uh, when I interviewed uh, people at the church that the Henke served, um, and these are, you know, this is in the 2000s, right? 2010, 2011, um, many of them mentioned having photographs, these are Chinese families, but they burned them during the cultural revolutions, they don't have any more left because it was you know, a danger to have you know, some of these images just hanging around. So in a way it comes down to, you know, what kind of access can you um, have um, as well as you know, just kind of tracing what happens to images after they're made um, to the question of how to construct a history using visual sources and technologies. Um, I like to think about it in terms of uh, makers, subjects, and audiences. Where are we seeing makers as part of this history? Where are subjects in these images and technologies part of this history? And what are the audiences? Um, and that's the kind of uh, approach I talk, I use to talk to uh, about to my undergraduates about images. And that's uh, again a starting point to think about how we might embed the visual and visual image making in history. So several people in the audience are interested in the question of cultural clash between, um, I don't know if we lost you there. <laughs> oh, I'm still here. Just plugging in my computer so it doesn't oh, die. Okay. <laughs> um, they're interested in the cultural clash between Americans and Chinese people, particularly as they came into contact through um, photography. Um, so one question is asking, through the personal images you collected, can you find any experiences of cultural clash between the United States and Chinese people in the early 20th century? And in kind of related note, someone was curious about um, if there were any instances of, of racism that you encountered in, in these photographs or anti-foreign sentiment. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I didn't see a lot in terms of racism or cultural clashes. I think it was a real attempt, both on the part of the missionaries as well as uh, the Chinese individuals with whom they were working to try to work around or smooth those differences. Um, there are, this is again a time in which um, liberal elements and progressive elements in the United States are criticizing missions traditionally for being racist or, or to talk about Chinese and so-called, you know, as heathens and pagans. And this is a time period in which missionaries are wrestling with that. So they're trying to think about working with Chinese communities as partners and collaborators, as opposed to students and pupils that they have to teach or guide or, or enlighten. Um, so I didn't see a lot of those clashes. And certainly um, there aren't a lot of references uh, to differences in race. Um, the only image I found that was not made by the Hankies or the Lewis, it was actually from another missionary, um, this is the 1910s, was a reference to an, um, a group of Chinese children in which the, the photograph was underexposed. Their skin was really dark. And 
the photographer on the back of the image makes a reference to say that these children are not black. So in a way, there's like this technical difficulty and issue that's you know coming to this image, and then this kind of judgment or reference to skin color. But I'm still working on kind of what that means and how that would influence images um, taken in other periods. But certainly, that's a bigger topic, um, and I'm happy to explore it further later. So in terms of the afterlives of these images, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. There was also another question about whether these images were used um, specifically for missionary activities such as informational pamphlets or were they mainly used for personal or secular, secular use? So what happened to these images after they were taken? Where were they circulated? Who viewed them? Yeah. The question of reception is, is a fascinating one. And the images go in all, all sorts of directions. Some of them end up in family albums. Some of them are printed in church magazines. Some of them make it to the pages of National Geographic and even Life magazine, the most famous incident being um, the still images of uh, the Reverend John McGee, who was a Episcopal missionary in Nanjing when the Japanese invaded. Um, and had a movie camera with him and shot film footage of the military atrocities against civilians, um, Chinese civilians by the Japanese military. And those images were made into stills and reprinted in Life magazine. And clips of his uh, basic atrocity movies are also circulated around the world and sent to American communities, European communities, and even sent to Japan in an attempt to raise awareness about military atrocities happening in the moment in China so, and that's also covered in the fourth chapter of my book, but it's just this entire spectrum of uses ranging from the private to the very public that these images then pass through. Um, so we still have a couple of questions. I know you've been answering questions for a while, so we might wrap up soon, but I wanted to get um, to, uh, well, there are a couple of questions that are asked by William Ma, who has done a lot of research on visual imagery um, from, the, from the Chinese context. So I will uh, ask both of them and see what direction you want to take your answer in. So um, the first question is, he says, I love your idea about the photographer as subservient as he bends over the small camera toward his subject. It's also interesting to think about the popularity of moving images in your talk, the idea that bodies in motion seem to override a particular mode of seeing the Chinese other. So could you speak more on this subject of um, embodiment as it comes across in either the still images or in moving images? Um, and then his second question is thinking about the relationship between memory and photograph. Your, your work perfectly illustrates the fragility and perhaps futility of this relation. So I wonder if there are other ways to think about the relationship between memories and photographs. I guess maybe this is tying into what we were just talking about, about the afterlives of images. So I'll let you kind of tackle those very big conceptual questions in any way that you see fit. Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Ma. Those are really good questions. Um, the first about embodiment, and I wasn't able to show it or talk much about it in this presentation, but when the Hankies make that um, hospital and church film, those two reels that you saw in the still photograph, they choose a Chinese Christian doctor to be who they call the conductor. And he's essentially a tour guide. Um, and the, the, the camera captures him moving through different spaces of the mission. And not a single missionary appears in those movies. It is the Chinese Christian educated doctor who is the embodiment of this dual project that is simultaneously religious and simultaneously humanitarian and progressive. And this doctor walks through these spaces, he's pointing at things, and he is just literally um, you know, embodying what it means to be Chinese and Christian and thinking about those transnational communities that are connected to this mission. Um, and on the note, uh, and again, there's a, a lot of stuff there. Man, I could talk more about uh, kind of the, the specifics of what happens with the doctor as the conductor. Um, but in terms of the issue of memory and, and the fragility of images connected to it, these images pass through moments in which they become keystones for nostalgia. After 1949, 1950, a lot of these Chinese Christian communities and missionary communities are looking back on these images with a real sense of loss that there is something real here in the frame that is no longer there. 
Um, and that's, of course, the argument of Roland Barthes' book, uh, Camera Lucida, and that every photograph is a has been. That thing was there, but is there no longer. So in terms of memory, and even as um, missionary children, as uh, Chinese Christians look back on these images, there's always a tinge of nostalgia that there was once something here, there was once a community here, but is no longer like that, or is no longer there. So I, I think that's a good, kind of good entrance point to think about where these images and memory and the fraught connections and relationships come together. It's a wonderful way of summarizing both of those questions in one. Um, so maybe just one final quick question, continuing this idea of memory and the afterlives of images. Is there a plan to transfer the two film roles onto media that people can view today? <laughs> so the, the films that you were not able to show because of the limitations of Zoom, is there a way that people in the audience can access those films? That's great. And I'm glad you asked that. Um, all the films have been digitized. So all, almost all 6,400 feet of film that the Henke shot has been digitized. We sent them up to a company in San Francisco, frame by frame, digitizing them in 1080p high resolution. Um, and I'll be putting clips of those films on a companion website, which is going to be based at the University of Michigan, Deep Blue. Um, and the companion website just has the same title as the book. It will be released when the book comes out so that viewers and readers can, sorry, readers can become viewers and see clips of those movies in high resolution on that website. Fantastic. That's great to know. And again, gives you more impetus to go and pre-order the book right now. So um, we are just about out of time. And once again, I would like to um, extend my deepest gratitude and thanks to Dr. Joseph Ho for such an engaging and visually stimulating talk and uh, a really vibrant Q&A as well. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Our next webinar will be on October 12th, when we will be speaking to Marquitas Presswood about his new documentary on jazz music in China. We will drop the register, the link to register for that in the chat. So go register right now. Um, so I hope to see all of you again in a couple of weeks. Uh, and until then, take care.